Hello and welcome. I am Beth Mascheski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center, which is part of the Prairie Research Institute at the University of Illinois. This webinar and all of the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars are certified green events through the University of Illinois Institute for Sustainability, Energy, and Environment. To find out more about certified green events through U of I, please visit sustainability.illinois.edu. Find out more about the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center's webinars, please visit istc.illinois.edu slash events. A few housekeeping items before we get started. You can download the slides in the handout section of the GoToWebinar toolbar. Today's webinar is being recorded. The recording and slides will be available for viewing within about a week. I'll be emailing um, everyone who registered for the webinar once those are available. Everyone will remain muted for the entire webinar. You can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and I'll be reading those to the speaker at the end. So with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Mark Crocker. Mark is a professor in the Department of Chemistry and also associate director at the Center for Applied Energy Research, both being at the University of Kentucky. He earned his bachelor's and PhD in chemistry from the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom and spent two years as a NATO research fellow at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He has 15 years of industrial experience with Shell Research in Amsterdam and Degussa's Automotive Catalyst Division in Michigan. His research interests include carbon dioxide recycling using microalgae, biofuels, and environmental catalysts. So Mark, thank you for joining us. The webinar is yours. Well, thank you for the kind introduction, Beth, and good afternoon, everyone. So today I'm gonna to be talking about some work that we've been involved with for about the last 10 or 11 years concerning the capture of CO2 emissions using microalgae and the subsequent utilization of those uh, uh, emissions. So in this context, why are we interested in microalgae? Well, of course, they are the fastest growing photosynthetically uh, active organisms on the planet and they are extremely biodiverse. Well over 30,000 uh, species are known, existing in a wide uh, range of environments. Moreover, their cultivation doesn't compete with conventional agriculture. That's to say one doesn't require arable land or fresh water for their cultivation, uh, at, least if, at least if one is growing um, saline uh, species. And perhaps most interestingly, a wide variety of products can be obtained from microalgae which makes them a very suitable feedstock for integrated biorefineries. So if we are going to capture and recycle CO2 using microalgae, then we can devise a conceptual process schematic uh, looking something like the one shown here. Now in our case, uh, we have an industrial point source of CO2, specifically a coal-fired power plant. And so we would envisage feeding the flue gas uh, from that power plant to algae contained in some kind of a cultivation system. Of course, the algae also require water and certain essential nutrients. And in the presence of solar radiation, photosynthesis occurs, converting the CO2 into algal biomass and oxygen. Now, periodically, the algae have to be harvested and dewatered with recycle of the water and any unused nutrients back to the cultivation system. The algae biomass itself could be then used uh, as is perhaps, uh, as would be the case uh, for animal feed, or it could be fractionated into its constituents, uh, specifically proteins, carbohydrates, and lipids, and these could be further processed into a variety of products. So when we started this work, we felt that there were a number of key issues that had to be resolved. The first being, is algae cultivation using coal-derived flue gas even feasible? And if it is, is bioaccumulation of heavy metals problematic for the utilization of the resulting biomass? And then secondly, in the case of algae-based bioplastic production, which I'm gonna be focusing on today, which biomass processing scheme offers the greatest potential in terms of revenue um, of those available? 
And here one has a choice between utilizing the whole biomass as opposed to first extracting the lipids from the biomass and then utilizing the solid residue versus fully fractionating the biomass into its constituent lipids, carbohydrates, and protein, and using the, the protein-rich solid residue uh, obtained from that fractionation process. And then finally, from a techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment perspective, which algae cultivation system, and I'll come on to that in a second, and which biomass processing scheme offers the greatest potential. So when we began this work, we felt that we had to um, have a strain which would be well suited for this particular type of application. And so we began by identifying 150 candidate strains from the literature and screening them for their specific growth rate at a pH of 5.5 and a temperature of 35 degrees C. So we chose slightly acidic conditions here because we felt that that would be representative of the conditions encountered uh, if we're using flue gas as a CO2 source. And it does get quite uh, hot in Kentucky in the summer, and so that's why we use the relatively high temperature of 35 degrees C. And these different strains were screened in four different growth media, that's to say uh, standard nutrient recipes. And the outcome was that we were able to identify a promising strain, namely Scenodesmus cutis, that is native to Kentucky. It grows well under a wide variety of conditions and it's extremely robust, which is very good if you have chemists and chemical engineers um, trying to grow it. So at that point, we needed to decide um, on the nature of the cultivation system that we were going to use. And here there's a clear choice between open raceway ponds on the one hand and closed loop photobioreactors on the other. And both systems have their advantages and disadvantages. In the case of open ponds, the advantages are fairly clear, they're relatively inexpensive to build, the technology is mature, and operationally they're very simple. However, there are significant disadvantages, namely significant evaporative losses of water, particular, particularly in uh, warmer climates, and of course they are subject to external contamination by invasive organisms some of which are algae grazers. And additionally, their CO2 and light utilization efficiency tends to be rather low, such that the maximum growth rates uh, obtained in ponds tend to top out at around about 20 grams per square meter per day, uh, even under the most favorable circumstances. Now, in the case of photobioreactors, aerial productivities tend to be somewhat higher. And in fact, uh, we've calculated our or a measured maximum growth rates in the order of about 40 grams per square meter per day. Of course, you don't have the same um, concerns with respect to evaporative losses. Uh, and contamination by invasive organisms is, generally speaking, much less of a problem. The principal disadvantage of photobioreactors is that they are expensive to build. Nevertheless, when we started this work, we felt that photobioreactors were much less developed as a technology than open ponds. And we felt that there was some room to uh, improve the design of photobioreactors whilst lowering the cost. And so we set ourselves the target of developing our own low cost, low cost photobioreactor. And the result was the cyclic flow photobioreactor shown here. So here's a, a small 1200 liter unit that we built at the University of Kentucky. I haven't got time to go into all of the details. Suffice to say that the reactor consists of a series of vertically oriented parallel clear plastic tubes. Uh, these tubes are actually made of PET and so they are fully recyclable. Uh, flue gas is introduced at the bottom of each of these tubes and this gas as well as serving as the source of the CO2 also ensures good mixing in the water column. And roughly four times per day, the tubes are drained. The liquid is pumped into a main feed tank, and from there it's pumped back into the tubes. And this serves two purposes. First of all, it ensures that the uh, composition of the culture remains homogeneous. And secondly, it serves to activate so-called pipe pigs, which are located in each of the tubes. 
And these pipe pigs are buoyant devices which are fitted with uh, silicone rubber gaskets at each end. And as the tubes are drained of water, so the pipe pigs move to the bottom of the tube. And as the tubes are refilled with water, then so the pipe pigs move back up uh, to the top of the tubes here. And in this manner, a mechanical scouring action is obtained, which removes any accumulated biofilm that has adhered to the inner surfaces of the tubes. Uh, and this is particularly important because uh, uh, biofilm accumulation in photobioreactors is, uh, is really a notorious problem. Uh, and these pipe pigs um, solve this issue very uh, effectively. Well, this technology has been licensed to uh, a company in China, Lian Henhui Investment Company, based in Zhengzhou. Here you can see a photograph of a 100,000 liter cyclic flow PBR, which has been operating um, pretty much continuously since 2018. And they're currently scaling this up to uh, a million liters. And the estimated cost, that's to say the material cost of this PBR, at least in China, is calculated to be 44 cents per liter. So at this point, we had our algae strain, we had our cultivation system. The next thing we needed to do was demonstrate the technology. And fortunately, Duke Energy made available to us their East Bend Station for this purpose. Now, East Bend Station is a coal-fired power plant located in northern Kentucky on the uh, banks of the Ohio River. It's a 650 megawatt scrubbed unit equipped with a suite of modern pollution controls. And as you can see, the flue gas composition um, comprises roughly 10% uh, CO2, something like 50 to 70 ppm of NOx on average, and about 20 to 30 ppm of SO2. And so we deployed our photobioreactor at East Bend Station in addition to four 1100 liter open raceway ponds, as shown here. So here you see some um, typical productivity data obtained at East Bend. This is for our cyclic flow photobioreactor, uh, and the data corresponds to the summer of 2015. On this axis, I'm showing the culture productivity in grams of biomass per liters per day. And on the other axis here, I'm showing the daily integrated PAR, where PAR corresponds to uh, photosynthetically active radiation. So this is the solar intensity in those wavelengths that the algae can actually utilize for photosynthesis. And the units here are micromoles of photon, photons per square meter per day. So the blue trace here corresponds to the PAR. As you can see, it varies fairly widely uh, due to the fact that we have both sunny days and, of course, cloudy days. The closed circles correspond to the culture productivity during those periods when we were operating using flue gas from the, from the power plant. The open circles correspond to the culture productivity during those periods when we were obliged to operate using CO2 from gas cylinders. And this was necessitated by the fact that we experienced several plant outages um, during our measurement campaign. Uh, and the regularity or the frequency of these plant outages was actually quite a surprise to us. What you can see is that the culture productivity roughly uh, tracks the, the PAR values, which is not too surprising. In other words, when it's sunny, the algae grow well. When it's cloudy, they don't. Uh, the average algae productivity during this period, uh, in this case, this was about, uh, I think, three and a half months, was equivalent to 0 0.165 grams per liter per day. And on an aerial basis, this is about 35 grams per square meter per day uh, based on the footprint of the photobioreactor. So now I'm showing some data comparing the concentration of CO2 going into the photobioreactor with the concentration exiting the photobioreactor. Um, this chart is rather busy, so let me just spend uh, a few seconds uh, talking you through it. The red trace here corresponds to the uh, temperature of the culture inside the photobioreactor. The blue trace corresponds to the PAR. So you can see that we're actually looking at the daily values here. So the, the maximum value here would correspond to roughly the middle of the day. Of course, at nighttime, the PAR value drops to zero. 
The green trace corresponds to the inlet CO2 concentration, and the purple trace corresponds to the CO2 concentration in the gas exiting the photobioreactor. And you can see that when it's sunny, we are getting a significant, significant amount of CO2 uptake. Of course, during the nighttime, uh, photosynthesis isn't occurring, and so there's no uptake of CO2. So overall, the average CO2 capture efficiency during daylight hours was 44%. I should also mention that uh, this figure relates to a situation in which we were sparging the, uh, the culture in the photobioreactor for five seconds every minute, which meant that five, for 55 seconds of each minute, the sparger was turned off. Five seconds was sufficient to fully saturate the liquid in the photobioreactor with CO2, uh, and during the subsequent 55 seconds, um, some of that CO2, although not all of it, was consumed by the uh, algae culture. So here we're looking at NOx in versus NOx coming out of the photobioreactor. Again, the red trace corresponds to the uh, culture temperature. The blue trace is the PAR. Green, the green trace is the inlet NOx concentration. And the purple trace is the outlet NOx concentration. So in this case, we're getting about 41.5% uh, NOx removal. So what's happening here is that some of the NOx is dissolving in culture medium, it's converted to nitrate, and of course nitrate is an excellent source of nitrogen for our microalgae. And now let's look at the SOX. Again, the green trace here is the inlet SOX concentration, and the purple trace, which you can't really see because it's in the baseline, is the outlet SOX concentration. So in this case, we're getting 100% SOX removal efficiency. This isn't too surprising because, of course, both SO2 and SO3 are extremely soluble in water, dissolving to ultimately form sulfate. And we find that our algae culture is able to completely uh, utilize the sulfate as a nutrient. We tracked the sulfate concentration in the culture over a period of uh, five months during the entire summer, and we found that there was no uh, buildup in the sulfate concentration. Uh, so it is completely utilized by the culture. And importantly, we also analyzed the culture for the bioaccumulation of heavy metals potentially present in the flue gas. Now, before we did that, we analyzed the algae nutrients by means of ICPMS. And as you can see from this chart, we found that the super triple phosphate, which is the phosphorus source we're using um, for our algae cultivation, contains significant amounts of arsenic, cadmium, and selenium. This is perhaps a little surprising at first hand, but you have to bear in mind um, that this phosphate is a mined product. It's essentially dug out of the ground and um, put into bags, and, and really there is very little uh, processing other than that. The uh, other nutrients, namely urea, potash, and Sprint 3030, this is a, a chelated iron compound, contain very little in the way of heavy metals. And the bars on the extreme right here correspond to the weighted concentrations of these heavy metals in the dry nutrient mixture that we were supplying to the algae. Now, based on these concentrations, we can calculate the theoretical maximum concentration of these metals that could be expected to, uh, to be found in the dry algae were the algae to bioaccumulate all of the heavy metals supplied. Of course, this final concentration in the uh, algal biomass is also contingent upon the concentration of algae in solution, or in the culture, I should say, um, at the time of harvesting. Now, at East Bend Station, we typically uh, uh, harvested the algae when it reached um, a concentration of about uh, 0.85 grams per liter. And these stars here correspond to the expected heavy metal concentrations at the time of harvesting, again, assuming that all of the heavy metals supplied with the nutrients are bioaccumulated by the algae. So in the case of arsenic, selenium, and, and mercury, they're, they're fairly low. But in the case of cadmium, you can see that it is relatively high, corresponding to a value of about 7 ppm here. 
So now let's look at the actual concentrations of these heavy metals detected in the algal biomass produced at East Bend Station. So the first thing you'll notice is that the uh, concentrations of heavy metals in biomass produced in the photic bioreactor is very much lower than the uh, are very much lower than the corresponding concentrations um, obtained for biomass grown in the ponds. And I'll come back to this in a moment. In all cases, we find that the measured cadmium concentrations are well below the theoretical maximum, the theoretical maximum based on the amount of cadmium in the nutrients, whilst the selenium concentration is at or below the theoretical maximum. However, in the case of arsenic, we find that the arsenic concentration in ponds one, three, and four is actually slightly above the theoretical maximum based on the algae nutrients. In other words, for these three ponds, there is clear evidence that there has uh, some bioaccumulation of arsenic has occurred, that arsenic being supplied from the flue gas. In all cases, the average mercury concentrations uh, denoted by these uh, gray bars are close to the minimum detection level and are actually below the minimum reportable level. So that just brings me back to the original observation I made, namely that the heavy metal concentrations in the biomass produced in the PBR is much lower than the uh, biomass produced in the ponds. Why is that? Well, because the ponds are so much less productive than the photobioreactor, the incubation time of the biomass in the ponds is very much longer. So what happens is that the biomass in the ponds is exposed to a much greater volume of flue gas between harvests than the biomass in the photobioreactor. In fact, we estimate that the um, biomass in the ponds is exposed to between six and nine times as much flue gas as the biomass in the photobioreactor. So obviously there is much, uh, there's much greater potential for the accumulation of heavy metals in the culture uh, from the flue gas in the case of the ponds. Nevertheless, these comments notwithstanding, the ultimate concentrations of heavy metals present in the biomass are such that the biomass would be suitable for bioplastic applications and indeed even for food packaging applications. So that's, that's really the good news here. Which takes me on to the potential products that we can make from our algal biomass. And here there's a clear trade-off between the market size of these potential products and their value. Now, of course, what we would like is to be over here on this chart. That's to say, we'd like to produce a valuable product for which there is a huge market. Of course, the reality of the situation is rather different. We have a choice. We can either focus on products for which there is a huge market, such as fuels and animal feed, but which command relatively low selling prices. Or we could focus on high value products such as chemicals, and in particular fine chemicals such as omega-3 unsaturated fatty acids, which are used as uh, nutraceuticals. However, while these products are um, high in value, the market size is relatively small. Indeed, if we were to build one or two world scale algae plants, uh, focused on producing omega-3 unsaturated fatty acids, we would probably saturate the global market. So what to do? Well, we believe that bioplastics represent a good compromise. Namely, they are a product for which there is a reasonably large but growing market, and they do command a reasonably high value. And if we look at bioplastics uh, production, currently it amounts to uh, something like 7.2 uh, million tons uh, on a worldwide basis. This represents about 2% of all plastics produced. Nevertheless, the market size is growing fairly significantly with a compounded annual rate of about 20%. So at this juncture, I have to make a dis distinction between two types of bioplastics. The first would be uh, polymers produced from a monomer which is derived from biomass, in this case, algal biomass. The second type of bioplastic would be a composite material 
prepared by mixing in biomass with a petroleum derived resin. And it's this type of composite material that I'm going to be talking about today. Now in these bioplastics, the algae biomass can substitute for up to about 50% weight of the polymer. Moreover, the algae actually functions as um, essentially a cross-linking agent. It's more than an inert filler, it's actually a functional filler. And that's because during melt processing of the bioplastic, the proteins in the algae cross-link, which is beneficial for the uh, mechanical properties of the produced bioplastic. And for this reason, a high protein content of the algae is typically beneficial for polymer properties. Now, in the case of durable, durable plastics, such as high-density polypropylene, we can actually talk about sequestration of CO2 in the biomass, because of course, uh, these durable plastics are gonna take hundreds of years uh, to decompose. Obviously, in the case of biodegradable blends, such as polylactic acid or polybutylene adipate terephthalate, we're not actually sequestering the CO2 in the algae cells. We're simply capturing CO2 and then recycling it, because of course, that CO2 is going to be released within a couple of years as the bioplastic degrades. So uh, in our studies, we've been working with uh, Algix, which is a small startup company based in Meridian, Mississippi. They are the world leaders in algae-based bioplastics, and their main product is this um, so-called Bloom uh, algae-based foam. And this material is used um, as uh, an insole in various, mainly sporting shoes. So one example would be the Adidas Prime Knit running shoe, shown here. Another is the uh, Vivo, Aqua, uh, Vivo Aqua uh, Aquatic Running uh, Shoe, shown here. So how do we make these bioplastics? It's actually relatively simple. One takes a, uh, a polymer, uh, obviously a petroleum derived polymer. Uh, one adds small amounts of certain um, additives to ensure good mixing with the, uh, the biomass. The biomass is then added um, before use, it's uh, dried and ground. So the, uh, the polymer, uh, the molten polymer is, is mixed here with the biomass and then the resulting bioplastic is extruded, typically in the form of beads. And these beads can then be used for a variety of end applications. Um, so for example, injection molding, sheet extrusion, blow molding, et cetera, can be used to uh, prepare shaped materials. In previous work, we've tend to, tended to look at um, some fairly well-known, well-studied uh, bioplastic blends such as ethylene vinyl acetate. Um, more recently, we've extended our work to include nylon and PVAT, that's to say polybutylene adipate terephthalate. Um, this is a biodegradable polymer uh, which commands fairly high selling prices. Uh, that's to say it's significantly more valuable um, than en engineering plastics such as um, polyethylene or um, uh, polypropylene. So at this point, I'd like to just remind you of the three questions that I posed at the beginning of this talk. And the second one of those was, what is the appropriate biomass processing scheme for processing algae biomass into a feedstock that can be used for the production of bioplastics? And you'll recall that here we have a choice between utilizing the whole biomass, the biomass that has been first subjected to extraction of the lipids, or alternatively, completely fractionating the biomass and just using the, the protein-rich solid, which remains after the lipids and the sugars have been removed. So in order to fractionate our biomass, we have to come up with a, a suitable method. And to cut a long story short, what we do is to lyse the algae cells using a mixture of methanol and hydrochloric acid. We then add hexane, and the hexane removes these lipids. Now, due to the presence of the methanol and the acid, the lipids are converted to the corresponding fatty acid methyl esters by means of esterification and transesterification reactions. And so um, with our hexane extraction, we're actually removing the fatty acid methyl esters um, that have been formed. What's left behind is an aqueous slurry 
And this can then be filtered to obtain the uh, protein-rich solid remaining, while the aqueous phase contains mainly dissolved sugars. And of course, uh, these can then be fermented to produce uh, bioethanol. So in order to optimize this process, we performed a design of experiments. Uh, we examined the uh, uh, lysing temperature, the concentration of acid used for the lysing, and the uh, volume of methanol. And in all cases, we used an extraction time of two hours. So you can see the results of the uh, design of experiments on this slide. Uh, suffice to say that increasing the temperature and the acid concentration during the lysing step leads to a higher yield of aqueous phase components and a lower yield of solids. And this is not too surprising as we increase the severity of the lysing step. So we are increasingly hydrolyzing the carbohydrates present to simple sugars. And of course, if we, if we go too far, we can actually start to hydrolyze the protein present to give aqueous um, or, or at least water soluble compounds. Although typically that doesn't happen under our conditions. Uh, increasing the acid concentration tends to decrease the lipid yield, which we're um, had us scratching our heads a little bit, um, while increasing the temperature leads to an increased yield of uh, lipids. So obviously increasing the temperature is beneficial for the lysing step. And we find that in all cases, the volume of methanol has little effect, excuse me, on the yields of all of the fractions, which actually suggests that we could actually use a lower volume of methanol for um, this fractionation process. So on this slide, I'm comparing some of the properties of the three types of biomass that we prepared. That's to say the whole biomass, the lipid extracted biomass, and the protein rich solid from fractionation. And you can see that as the degree of processing increases, then so the protein content of the biomass increases, which should be beneficial for polymer properties. Now, Algix is also very concerned about um, the presence of odor-causing compounds in the biomass. Uh, obviously, some of these odor-causing compounds can be a major concern, uh, particularly if one is trying to make consumer products. Typically, these odor-causing compounds are associated with the presence of uh, nitrogen or sulfur um, groups um, in, the, uh, in the volatile compounds, which can be emitted from the algae. Uh, additionally, furans have been identified as uh, giving rise to um, odor issues as well. Aldix had their own test for uh, detecting these compounds. It involves heating the biomass to 140 degrees C and then analyzing for these compounds using headspace analysis. And as you can see here, another beneficial effect of this fractionation process is that one significantly decreases the number of odor-causing compounds which are remaining in the biomass. Uh, and that's because most of these, or a significant number of these odor-causing compounds are um, associated with the lipids uh, present in the whole biomass. Another beneficial effect of the processing is that we find that there is only 2.2 weight percent ash present in the protein-rich solid resulting from fractionation, and a low ash content um, is very beneficial in general for biopolymer proper properties. So based on these uh, encouraging results, um, uh, PBAT blends were prepared containing varying amounts of uh, the three different types of algae biomass, and the resulting bioplastic was then um, uh, formed into different shapes, such as tensile bars and filament, for subsequent mechanical testing. I haven't got time to show you the results today. Suffice, <coughs> suffice to say that PBAT incorporating the protein-rich solid resulting from fractionation was found to show superior mechanical properties to the pure PVAT resin, uh, which is a very encouraging result. So at this point, I'd like to switch gears a little and now go on to consider the uh, techno-economic analysis and life cycle assessment implications of this processing scheme. So here you see the system boundary for our calculations. And we're considering here three different algae cultivation systems, the open raceway pond, our cyclic flow photobioreactor, and a combined photobioreactor open raceway pond system. 
So the idea in this combined system is that you would produce very healthy uh, biomass in the photobioreactor. This would be used to not only inoculate the open raceway ponds, but one would also periodically overseed the ponds with fresh biomass from the photobioreactor. In this way, one would try to maintain the algae in the ponds in the best possible state uh, with respect to health and the potential um, avoidance of invasive organisms, thereby maximizing the productivity of the pond. In all cases, the algal biomass produced would be dewatered and would then be processed by one of these three routes, i.e. drying the whole biomass, extracting the lipids and then drying the biomass, or fully fractionating the biomass and taking the protein-rich solid and again drying it. The biomass would then be ground, at which point it is ready to be made into bioplastics. And you'll notice that we didn't consider the uh, actual bioplastic preparation in these calculations, and that's because it would be the same um, for all of these different processing routes. So just a few words about the TEA. Uh, this was based on the Bioenergy Technolo Technologies Office nth plant assumptions. Uh, a few of the key points here are a 10% internal rate of return, 35% uh, tax rate, uh, seven year uh, depreciation of assets, 30 year plant life, and the calculations are performed as a net present value cash flow reported in 2016 dollars. As regards the LCA, the functional unit selected was one kilogram of bioplastic feedstock and the global uh, warming reporting metric or, uh, was CO2 equivalent emissions. And other data was obtained from standard um, LCA uh, databases. So now let's look at the results of the TEA, starting with the open raceway pond growth structure. And what I'm showing here on the y-axis is the minimum selling price of the produced bioplastic feedstock in dollars per kilogram of bioplastic feedstock produced. And this analysis has been, for, has been performed, as you'll see, for the three different processing scenarios, namely drying only, lipid extraction, and fractionation. So the gray bars here show the, the net result in each case, and these uh, colored bars they actually break the result down into the constituent components. So you can see that the, uh, the component costs towards this minimum selling price are the capital cost of the installation, variable operating costs, fixed operating costs, and taxes. And it's immediately apparent that the um, economically most attractive scenario is going to be drying only. Now, in the case of lipid extraction, we do have co-product credits. Specifically, we're making biodiesel in this case, because we're assuming that the lipids that we're extracting can be sold as uh, biodiesel. Uh, however, you'll see that this doesn't affect the economics very much, and that's because A, we're not making a lot of biodiesel, and B, it's not very valuable in any case. In the case of fractionation, we're assuming that we're making both biodiesel, and we're also fermenting the aqueous sugars produced uh, to produce bioethanol. But again, the value of these biofuels is very, very low and doesn't compensate for the extra cost associated with this additional processing of the biomass. So clearly, um, the drying only scenario is to be preferred. And you'll see that the minimum selling price here corresponds to just under $1 per kilogram of uh, bioplastic feedstock produced. It's actually about 99, uh, 97 cents a kilogram. So now I'm comparing all of the TEA results. That's to say for the open raceway pond, and I just showed you these results. Uh, here you see the results for the photobioreactor, and this is the combined growth system. Now in the case of the photobioreactor, you'll notice that the minimum selling price here is now at $4 per kilogram. In other words, the biomass is roughly four times more expensive to produce in the photobioreactor as compared to the open raceway pond. Why is this? 
It's because photobioreactors are intrinsically more expensive to build, even though we did our best to minimize the, uh, the cost of our photobioreactor. The capital costs involved with their construction is still very significant. Again, you'll see that the, um, the most favorable scenario here is drying only. Again, the um, co-product credits we get for the other two scenarios are nowhere near enough to compensate for the extra costs associated with this additional processing of the biomass. And in the case of the combined growth system, it actually falls between that of the photobioreactor and the open raceway pond. So this just shows you the summary graph. So these are all of the net results. And again, they just emphasize that uh, open raceway ponds are going to be the uh, economically uh, most favorable um, production system and drying only is the most attractive scenario. I should also point out here that the um, uh, minimum selling price for the uh, drying only scenario of about 97 cents per kilogram actually falls within the range for which uh, biomass going into the bioplastic uh, industry um, actually commands. So if you want to sell um, algae into the bioplastic uh, industry, then you're going to get uh, a value for your biomass corresponding to this range here. So this tells us that um, using these nth plant assumptions, if we were to build a plant to produce biomass in this manner, we could actually sell it into the bioplastic uh, industry um, in an economically feasible manner. So now let's switch to look at the results of the techno, uh, sorry, of the life cycle uh, assessment. Starting again with the open raceway pond growth structure. And here on the y-axis, we're now looking at kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions per kilogram of bioplastic feedstock produced. And again, we're looking at the three different processing scenarios here. And again, the uh, gray bar shows the net result here, while the colored bars here actually break the result down into the constituent parts. So, for example, in the case of the drying only scenario, we have CO2 uptake by the um, culture in the pond. So, this is the net CO2 uptake of CO2 by the culture. However, when we process the culture, that's to say we harvest it, we dewater it, we dry it, and we grind it, obviously that costs energy, and so there are CO2 emissions associated with that energy use. And the net result here is, is essentially zero. In the case of the lipid extraction and fractionation pathways, you can see that we now have a net CO2 emission. That's because of course, we have to expend additional energy associated with the extra processing of the biomass. Additionally, we are obtaining a small credit, a, a, a greenhouse gas emission credit for the production of these um, biofuels because uh, we're displacing um, fuel by producing these biofuels. However, when we combust those biofuels, of course, we also emit CO2 emissions and so that's another reason why we have a net CO2 emission here. So now I'm comparing the open raceway pond system with our photobioreactor and the combined growth system. And perhaps the most interesting result here concerns the photobioreactor because you can see that for the drying only scenario, we now achieve a net negative CO2 emission. In other words, even after processing the biomass, we have still achieved a net capture of CO2. And this is because our uh, photobioreactor is extremely energy efficient. And so we expend very little energy in actually growing the algae. So we achieve a, a, a fairly large uh, overall capture of CO2 in our photobioreactor so that even after processing of the biomass, we're achieving a net CO2 capture here. Obviously, in the case of the uh, more involved uh, biomass processing, because we're expending energy 
And of course, we're producing fuels, which are going to be combusted. We now have a net positive CO2 emission. And in the case of the combined growth system, again, it falls between the foggy bioreactor and the open raceway pond system. So again, let's look at the summary graph. And again, this just confirms that from an LCA standpoint, the uh, photo bioreactor is the most attractive system. Now, I should also point out here that if we look at the uh, greenhouse gas emissions associated with the production of the plastic resin going into our bioplastic, you can see that it corresponds here to a value of about two kilograms CO2 equivalent emission, uh, two kilograms of CO2 equivalent emissions per kilogram of uh, plastic. What this means is that for any of these scenarios, if we take the biomass that we've produced here and we mix it into our plastic resin to produce a bioplastic, in so doing, we're going to be displacing a certain amount of this plastic resin. And in so doing, we will actually lower the CO2 footprint of our bioplastic compared to the pure plastic resin. So that's really the good news here. It, it, it's kind of a win-win situation. It doesn't matter even if we don't achieve a net capture of CO2 when we're producing our biomass, because we're displacing a petroleum-derived resin, the resulting product is going to be more environmentally friendly than the pure plastic resin. So I think at this point, um, it just remains for me to uh, give you a brief summary. So hopefully I convinced you that based on our results, uh, it can be concluded that algae bioplastics could be made economically today in an nth of a kind plant. We find that all bioplastic scenarios are more environmentally favorable than petroleum derived resins. And we find that a fuels co-product is clearly not the best choice for this system. In order to justify the extra cost of biomass processing to produce a co-product, that co-product clearly has to be uh, of significant value. Uh, and in that respect, biofuels simply don't cut it. And finally, we believe that high value bioplastics represent a very promising target for the utilization of algae biomass, both from a TEA and an LCA perspective. And by high value bioplastics, I'm really talking about these, um, I hesitate to call them niche um, plastics because something like PVAP is not really a niche plastic. Um, it is very widely used. It has very many applications, um, but it's not a, an engineering um, plastics like um, um, polypropylene or polyethylene. Nonetheless, these, uh, these bioplastics, which are used widely, um, in some cases can command very high selling prices and uh, to us at least they appear to be a very promising target for uh, algae biomass utilization. So with that it just remains for me to thank the agencies that have funded this work, particularly the Department of Energy and also in its early stages um, the Commonwealth of Kentucky. Of course a lot of people were involved in this work and at the University of Kentucky um, I have to thank the, uh, the people shown here. Uh, I'm also indebted to our collaborators at Colorado State University, uh, Dr. Jason Quinn, who is the uh, TEA and LCA expert um, behind a lot of this work. And he was uh, he very ably assisted by his graduate students, Braden Beckstrom and David Kiroz. Um, at uh, Algex, Ashton Zeller and Ryan Hunt have been uh, indispensable in uh, providing advice and um, preparing and testing uh, bioplastics. And uh, Duke Energy, Doug Durst, was um, uh, very helpful in assisting us with our measurements. So with that, it just remains for me to thank you for your attention. And if there are any questions, I will be happy to try and answer them. Thanks for an excellent presentation, Mark. Before we dive into questions, I'll remind our audience that you can type in your questions through the GoToWebinar toolbar, and I'll be reading those to Mark. So our first question is, um, in slide 21, what is the lipid uh, content in whole algae sample? 
Uh, lipid content, yes. Um, so the uh, lipid content is typically 10 to 12, well, 10 to 15 uh, percent. Um, the concentration of esterifiable lipids uh, is typically 6 to 9 percent. Uh, the exact value depending on the um, growth conditions used. Um, typically, I would say the concentration of esterifiable lipids is about 7 percent and the total lipid concentration is about 12 percent. Next question is, any data available on biodegradability of PBAP with algae protein? What percent of algae protein was used and was there any processing done to the algae protein fractions, such as sizing? Um, okay, so in terms of sizing, yes, um, algae have a standard methodology here. They grind their um, the biomass and then it's uh, passed through a mesh. Um, I'm struggling to remember the size. I think it's something like 70, it has to pass through a 75 micron mesh, as I recall. Um, and that's kind of a standard um, procedure for, for all biomass going into um, their bioplastics. Um, no other particular processing was used um, in terms of the protein-rich solid um, resulting from fractionation. In terms of biodegradability data, yeah, that's a really interesting question. Right now, we don't have any data. Um, that's something that we're actually planning to do. How is the stability of the algae plastics to water? Are these hydrophobic, hydrophilic? Any water uptake? No, there's no water uptake. These are hydrophobic materials. So that there's really no difference as compared to a pure resin uh, bioplastic, uh, pure resin plastic. What percent of flue gas was utilized and what would be the size of an algae plant that would treat the entire flue gas flow? Okay, so we were taking a very, 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 very small slipstream. Um, I think if one were to calculate it on a, uh, a kilowatt basis, it would be, oh uh, gosh, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to remember here, maybe 10 kilowatts equivalent, something like that. Um, not very much, um, put it that way. As regards um, the second part of that question, um, yeah, I get asked that quite a lot. So here is a specimen calculation for a hypothetical one megawatt um, coal-based power plant. Um, such a plant would produce about one ton of CO2 per hour. One ton of CO2, one ton of algae, excuse me, consumes 1.76 tons of CO2, between 1.76 and 1.80. And if we were to assume 30% CO2 capture in this case, which I think is, is uh, technically a, a more reasonable assumption than trying to capture all of the CO2, then, for example, if you had a pond with an aerial productivity of 10 grams per square meter per day, in order to capture 30% of the CO2 from what the one megawatt power plant, you would need um, 269 acres. Obviously, as your area productivity goes up, this number goes down correspondingly. Um, now, if you think about a 650 megawatt power plant, which, which is what East Bend is, then to capture 30% of that, you would have to multiply this figure here by 650 in the case of an algae productivity of, as I say, of 10 grams per square meter per day, which I think would be a reasonable average value for an open raceway pond. So we're talking about, um, yeah, very significant amounts of land. If you had a PUFA lipid co-product instead of biodiesel, would that change the conclusions on best extraction approach and cultivation reactor? Uh, it could do, um, depending on the value that one can obtain for that lipid. I mean, if it's an omega-3 unsaturated fatty acid, 
then um, certainly the economics uh, will start to look a lot better, yes. In our case, um, the lipids that were obtained weren't particularly valuable, and so making biodiesel from them was really the, um, the only available option. But yes, the economics would change. Uh, we do have a few more minutes for questions. So a reminder that you can type in your questions for the GoToWebinar toolbar, and I'll read those to Mark. Um, while we're waiting for a few more questions, I'll ask one. Um, I've stolen this question from a popular science podcast, which is Science Friday. Um, so if you had a blank check, what would be the best research to get this to market? The best research to get this to market? Um, well, in terms of algae generally, um, I, I think we have to be focusing on initially fairly high value products, um, things like um, omega-3 unsaturated fatty acids, that's already happening. Um, I don't think the there's 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 scope to develop that market much further. So yeah, I, I would have to say, biased uh, as I am, admittedly, I think one has to go for um, lower value products which have much greater market size. Um, that will enable um, larger algae plants to be built, and I think that will draw help to drive down the cost of algae production because right now it's just too expensive to produce algae. Um, so we need to be focusing on um, slightly lower value applications, but which have hopefully the economics of which are just about, are, are sufficiently favorable to make it economically viable so that we can start building these larger algae plants. Um, let's see, we just had one come in. How much algae has been produced annually and is it being produced currently? Um, so in terms of, of what we were doing at East Bend Station, um, I mean, typically we were only preparing maybe 20, 30, 40 kilograms of, of biomass a year. Um, what we actually found at East Bend Station is that um, as you start scaling up, it becomes more expensive. It becomes more of a headache to operate, certainly with, with, with graduate students. And you don't obtain any additional uh, useful information. So what we found is that for pilot scale studies, um, something around about 1,000 liters is really you know, as, as big as you really want to go. That was our experience. So yeah, typically in, in a summer, we've never made more than probably uh, 50 kilograms on a dry basis um, at most, uh, and typically probably a, a good deal less than that. Um, if you look at uh, Lian Henhui, our partners in China, to be honest, I don't know how much biomass they're producing. Um, it's probably in the order of sort of a few tons per year right now. Among the 150 species, did you also study marine algae, marine microalgae, and what are the limits of using marine water for bioplastic production? Ah, interesting question. No, we haven't looked at any marine algae. Um, and in terms of the limits of using marine algae for bioplastic production, um, Not sure much work has been done on that, to be honest. Algix, um, as far as I know, aren't using marine algae in any of their products. I don't think there would be any inherent limitation other than the fact that the ash content of the biomass has to be within acceptable limits. And um, for algix, that means the ash content in the dry biomass has to be less than 15 weight percent. Um, to me, 15 weight percent actually is, is quite a lot. Our biomass normally comes in around uh, probably five to eight weight percent, 
using our harvesting and dewatering method. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think marine uh, microalgae would be perfectly feasible, providing um, one keeps an eye on the ash content. As we're nearing the end of the hour, I'll ask one last question. For 30% capture and 40 gram algae per square meter per day productivity, land required is 67.3 acres. If you use PBR, how much land will be required compared to ORP? Um, so I would say our PBR typically has an aerial productivity, which is to at least twice that of a pond, I would say closer to probably three times that of, of um, a pond. Um, so essentially you can take the land required, that, that column, and um, if you're doing the PBR ORP comparison, um, you're going to need a third of the amount of land for PBR as compared to the ORP. Great, thank you for excellent presentation. Uh, what final thoughts would you like to leave us with? Um, well, these were very, uh, very good questions. So it sounds like there are um, people who are very interested in this, this topic. Um, I would say is there's a long road ahead, but I, I think there is some light at the end of the tunnel, um, if I can use that cliche. Um, I think we are making progress. Sometimes it, it's a little hard to see but I'm actually quite hopeful that within the next 10 years or so, we'll start to see some of these uh, medium value, medium volume applications for algal biomass. Um, so my parting words would be, um, yeah, thanks for the great questions and keep up the good work. Thanks, Mark. And I will end the webinar now. Thank you.